This is the mean value theorem for integrals, also known as the average value formula. Your book likes to call it the, they actually use, they think of them as two separate things, but they're really basically the same thing. And I will tell you, whenever you see the words mean value theorem, really that's almost 99.9% .9 of the time, that's referring to the mean value theorem you learned first semester, where the slope of the tangent equals the slope of the secant, right? So it's, the college board's never going to use mean value theorem I've never seen them use it in this context. They always just say, what's the average value? And so what I like to teach it as is just, this is the formula we're going to use to find an average value. And I want you to use this when you need an average value of anything, even stuff that you already know how to find the average of. Like first semester, we asked you things like, what's the average velocity? What's the average rate of change? These kinds of average values. I want you guys now to use this formula when you do those because it's a never fail, always correct, always works, perfect formula and you will never get them wrong. Kids miss average velocity more than anything else. So you're always doing change in velocity over change in time when it's actually change in position over change in time. So everyone always messes up average velocity. If you use this formula, you'll never get it wrong. So I want you to use this formula from now on. So here's what it says. Your average value, which your book calls f of c, uh, and I will tell you, when I was growing up, and actually I think in college too, I called it y bar. It was called y with a bar over the top when I was a kid. But uh, I don't know. Your book calls it f of c. Anyway, um, it says f of c equals 1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b of f of x dx. Now graphically, this means this. If I have a function on some interval from a to b, I know, it does look like a big pie symbol. All right, so here's what happens. So I've got this area under the curve. The average value of a function is the y value of a rectangle that produces the same area on this interval as the area under the curve. So if I were to sketch a rectangle in here like that, your height of this rectangle is considered the, ad is the average value of this function. So it's the height of a rectangle where the area under this rectangle is the exact same as the area under the curve. Now, how does that work? Well, if you think about it, if you cover this up and just look at this part, what does the integral from a to b of f of x give you? You can say it. Area. Area under the curve, right? From a to b. Okay, the integral from a to b of f of x gives you the area under the curve from a to b, right? This b minus a, b minus a, say a is, or b is like 10 and a is 3. So b minus a would be 7. What is that? That's the width. That's the width of your interval, right? That's this width. So if you took the b minus a and moved it up here, what you'd have is this. b minus a times some number equals area under the curve. So what you're getting is width times some number, which is this height, equals area under the curve. So area of rectangle equals area under the curve. So that's how that formula works, how it's developed. And that's what it looks like visually. But for now, we're just going to apply it in some generic find average value problems. These will come up, though, average value formula is in the free response of just about every AP exam ever published. So it's an important thing to know. And I want to make sure I'm getting the whole thing. Yeah. OK. So we're going to find the average value of f of x equals x squared plus 1 on the interval from 2 to 5. And then I'm going to walk you through how to find c. So I want everyone to take a minute, see if you can do the setup. This function, this is whatever you want the average value of. 
So if I wanted the average velocity, this is where the velocity would go. If I wanted an average number of ping pong balls, then the number of ping pong balls function would go right here. Okay? So whatever you want the average of, that's what goes in here. So in this problem, we want the average of this function on that interval. So I'm going to do the setup. Go ahead and see if you can do it all the way through, start to finish. Feel free to look at your neighbor and compare. with your setup. Any questions on that? Jump with the dx? Yes. Good. All right. When I am doing these problems, I keep this width, I keep it out front. You don't have to. You can multiply it into your function, but I just keep it out front and multiply it at the end. Uh, so here we go. We have one-third x cubed plus x from 2 to 5. So we end up with 1 third times 1 25 thirds uh, plus 5 minus 8 thirds plus 2. So you guys got? Yeah. And then uh, for time's sake, we're going to have some magic occur. This equals 14. Will we have to do that by hand? Can we write a magic on our Yeah. <laughs> um, Sometimes you have to do it by hand. Oh, all that number. Sometimes, right yes, yes, and sometimes you, you get to use calculator. That's so much. You never know. All right, so this is the average value. So the average value of that function on that interval is 14. Now, if they ask you to find C, on the graph, C would be the x value where the function and the average value happen to intersect. There might be more than one value for C, right? But it's that, that's what C represents. So here, to find C, all you're doing is finding the x value where the function has 14 as a y value. So you just set your function equal to 14. And I get x is plus or minus root 13. So does anyone know, is C both of these or one of them, and then which one? The positive one. It's the positive one. Why is it only the positive? Because of the domain. The domain. Because you have to, the C has to be in this interval. Right? So absolutely, very good. Have you seen so, that cartoon where that frog is just like sitting on that stone, and he's just like, what? So anyway, um, in your book tonight, or Sunday night, or Monday, second, Tuesday, second period, whenever you're doing this, right? If you have a problem that says use the mean value for, it, for integrals to find f of c or c, or if it says find the average value, you're doing the exact same method for either type. Okay, do you understand? So it's the same. It's the same for both. All right, it's time to learn the SFTC. Anyone know what SFTC stands for? Solar. 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 Solar.
standard. I'll give you a hint. Yesterday we were in the FTC. Second, second, second fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh -huh, you got it. Second fundamental theorem of calculus. So if you want to write that out in words, feel free. SFTC stands for the second fundamental theorem of calculus. All right. This theorem is going to look a little scary, but once you do the problems, it's actually one of the easiest theorems to apply of all the theorems you will learn. So I'm going to let you see it, and you have to copy it, but don't get scared, okay? I'm scared. It looks really long. Okay. So, there you go. Okay, well, I know what's I'm. I'm failing. No, you're not going to fail this. You're going to love it. Okay, you're going to love it. i got to get this plugged in or it's going to die. She's talking about everybody on YouTube. If she doesn't do this, you're going to die. Yep. <laughs> How horrible Come on, you, Ms. get power. Come on, get power. Whoops. Did you say Uh-oh, I just put a big black box on the screen. Oh! There we go. Oh, good. All right, it's in. All right, so there's the SFTC. <laughs> okay, so SFTC, you use this whenever you have to take the derivative of an integral with variables in the coefficients. So the derivative of an integral with variables in, or I'm sorry, Wait, in the limits, you, not coefficients, you, like, in the limits. Can you down or so, get shorter? Oh. Thanks. Okay, um, now when on earth would you have to find a derivative of an integral with variables in the limits? It actually happens a lot more often than you'd think. Okay, so, what are you even talking well, about? Well, here's the thing. When you have a function with variables in the limits, you guys are used to, um, if you have some function, like your integrals, you, um, you have some function and you're finding area under the function, right? Well, if the if the limits are variables, then what's happening is you're actually change your input's actually changing the region that you're finding under the function. The function stays static, but where you're finding area changes. This actually comes up more often than you'd think. So, for example, if the function represents something, and say your input is like time, and I want I don't want to have it be fixed from 3 to 12, I want it to be an input where I can plug in any time I want and find out something about it. So it, it, ha it really does, it does have a lot of relevance and when we uh, get into some free response practice, you will see context for these. But again for today, it's just nuts and bolts. So tonight your homework is all nuts and bolts, but we will have free response practice where we put these into a context. All right, here's all it means. You take the top limit, plug it in, times it by its derivative. Then you, take, you subtract, take the bottom limit, plug it in, times it by its derivative. You never even find an integral. So, because what you're, do you remember how like derivatives and integrals kind of undo each other, right? So you never have to actually anti-differentiate. All you do is take the top limit, plug it in, times it by its derivative, Subtract, bottom limit, plug it in, times it by its derivative. Okay, so let's do a couple examples and you're going to see how super easy and awesome these are. Once you learn this theorem, it's so easy to apply that you'll love it. It's the hard part is just remembering and recognizing when to use it. It's like riding a bike. Right. So if you can just remember I have a derivative and my, of an integral and my limits are variables. Even if one of the limits is a variable, you got to use the theorem. Okay, so starting with a simple example. So suppose we have the derivative of the integral from 3 to x squared of the square root of t minus 1 dt. The variable in the limits 
will you will not match the variable in the argument in the integrand uh, usually because they actually represent different things they don't have to sometimes they can represent the same thing but the input for the function is not necessarily the same as the input for the limits so you don't use the same variable that's okay you don't let that freak you out all right so here we go what's the answer we have a derivative of an integral with variables in the limits. I take the top limit and plug it in times the derivative of the top, 2x, minus take the bottom limit and plug it in times the derivative of the bottom, which is 0. zero. What this should tell you is any time one of your limits is a constant, its term is going to go to going to be zero. Right. So what we end up with then is just that. You should probably start with an example. Like lessens it. Like a fear. Like before you even teach us this. What? Oh, okay. You know what I'm saying? No. Oh. Yeah, man, it may be confused. It'll be like really yeah. So yeah. really quickly. I'm trying to help. I'm just trying to help this part. Without doing any work at all, what would the answer to this one be? Be the, same thing. Be the exact same thing. Exact same thing. Okay, let's do one. So what is it like? I don't know. What that By the way, your book when they present these, they're going to do it something like this. They'll say like big F of X equals, and let's do one with uh, a couple different functions. So let's go 3x to x squared of 2t plus 3 dt. So they'll say, hey, big F of x is this, and then they'll say, find big F prime. Well, I know what that is because I have the formula right that's here. right yeah see yeah. so this is the same thing as saying hey what's the derivative of an integral with variables in the limits right it's the same thing it's just a different way of presenting it so problem. what is the variables in the limit mean again those are your limits are your starting and your stopping points for when you're finding that area so you can now input different values for them they're like functions your limit values become functions so it's like a area of finding function now. Yes. So the yes. relationship between derivatives and integrals are unlike the relationship between exponents and like square or the root Yeah, they are inverse operations. But like if you were to take the derivative of an integral, it wouldn't equal 2t plus 3. So they wouldn't cancel each other out like that. Um, use that yes. Yes, if it's an indefinite integral with no limits, then absolutely it would just be that function. Okay. Yes. But once you add these limits in, it kind of changes things a little bit. All right, so here's what we have. Actually, do you guys want to take a second and try it? No. Yes. All right. Uh, take one second. You try it. Which, which, all right, never mind, I got it. Does that make sense? And then you could clean it up, right? So you'd have 4x cubed plus 6x minus 18x minus 9, right? And then you combine like terms. Your book might also ask you to do this same problem the long way. So if we were to do this the long way, here's what you'd have to do. So if you use the old-fashioned techniques, the ones that you already know instead of the formula, You'd actually have to find the antiderivative, so you'd get uh, t squared plus 3t evaluated from 3x to x squared, 
and you'd plug in your functions, right? So you'd have x to the fourth plus 3x squared minus 3x, so 9x squared minus 9x. That would be your big F of x. We want F prime, so we'd have to take the derivative of this, which would be 4x cubed plus 6x minus 18x minus 9. Wait, wouldn't you, need, wouldn't you need to have d, d, x for both, in front of both of them? No, that's why I said F prime. It's yep. the same thing as derivative. So you can either put a derivative here mm -hmm. and then just have the answer, or I found this and then took the derivative. Does it matter which variable you use? Because, like, you no. plug in x and there's like a t. And the You're x. plugging the x in for the t variable. But at the end notation, should it be in x's? It should be x's, yes, because the x is what you plugged in, so that oh, should be x. Well, wouldn't you need to have one for that one of these? Mm -hmm. oh, the big f of x? No, because I said, oh, 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 you are so right. What I should have said here was f prime of x equals. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Yes, you're absolutely right. Okay. <laughs> That's a BA. Good. All right, so homework this weekend is just in section 4.4. Four.